put um wonderful so the previous uh, session is now available on the website uh, for uh, the seminar series and without further ado i'm going to pass on the speaker floor to Murin Nir Rahali from University College Dublin who uh, works on refugee experiences in Ireland Many thanks, uh, Rhea, and thanks everyone to all the organisers for the invitation to speak today. So um, it's great to be here and to have people from so many different countries um, is just it'll be really fascinating for me to hear from from others and to learn from everyone. And um, so as Rhea said, uh, my name is Murin Lee Rahali. I'm an associate professor of social work at University College Dublin here in Ireland. Um, and I previously worked as a social worker with unaccompanied refugee children here in Ireland. Um, so my focus today, though, is on, I suppose, research that I've done more with families and um, adult refugees and their children. Um, so I'm not focusing on unaccompanied minors in this presentation, but I will make some reference to them. Um, so I'm going to I have 15 minutes and I guess it's a little bit tricky um, to to it's always tricky to fit things into 15 minutes. But particularly, I think when you're speaking to an international audience, because you kind of have to spend a little bit of time on the context. And um, so I'll, I'll do that at the start, a little bit of time on the context in relation to social work in Ireland and in relation to refugees and international protection applicants in the Irish context. And then I'm just going to look a little bit at the role of social work in the Irish context and kind of think a little bit about the extent to which social work is involved in this field and the extent to which perhaps the involvement of social work could be increased or social workers could have a, um, a bigger role maybe in supporting um, people of a refugee background. So um, just the first slide here is literally just in relation to, to the Irish social work context. So just to give a little bit of a of an understanding, I guess, of social work in Ireland. So in, so in Ireland, social work is a, a regulated profession like it is in, in many countries. Um, and I, I should have said in the first slide, I took the liberty of changing the title of my presentation slightly. So the original title had referred to social care. And in Ireland, there are two separate kind of disciplines, social work and social care. So I just thought it was it was better maybe to, to change it slightly. So the social work social workers in Ireland would generally either have, um, there's a, a, there are two degree programs that allow you to qualify as a social worker. And then there are five different master's social work. So we have master's of social work programs to, and you you apply then to register with the social work registration board so it's regulated and um, so and just for people who are not very familiar with Ireland so Ireland has a the Republic of Ireland I'm, I'm speaking about the Republic of Ireland and it has a population of about um, five million um, people so it's a small country and we're on the the very periphery of Europe so that has had um, a, you know quite a significant impact on the the numbers of of um, uh, refugees or international protection applicants that come to Ireland and the fact that we're on the, the Western periphery of, of Europe. And another important point, which I think is relevant to thinking about refugees and um, working with refugees as a social worker in Ireland is that the vast majority of social workers in the Irish context are employed by the state. So they're employed in um, by, by the government in areas such as child protection and welfare um, um, health services, um, hospitals, um, the probation service, prisons, and so on, and uh, disability services. So there are some social workers who are not state employed who are in NGOs, but it's a relatively small number. And I think this is, is, is kind of an important point in relation to um, working with refugees, given that the state, the state is going to be assessing claims for asylum and social workers are also working for the, for the same state. OK, so just to give a little bit of context then in relation to refugee families um, in the Irish context, and I guess I've I've kind of started thinking about this in relation to maybe three up until very recently, three different cohorts of um, refugee family groups, I, I guess, who who um, arrive in the Irish context. So the first of these are families who arrive, if you like, independently. And um, sometimes the word spontaneously is used, but I, I don't really like that word because um, given the, the challenges people have to, in, in entering states. And um, so people arrive, if you like, independently to seek asylum or to seek the, the terminology we're using in Ireland now is international protection. And they're accommodated in Ireland in a system known as direct provision. And this is a system where people generally live in institutional settings. They might be, for example, former hotels. 
um, that have been converted into uh, centres for refugees. There might be many families living in these centres and they get a minimal amount of, of support in terms of financial support. Until very recently, people didn't have the right to work. That has, has changed, but there's still limitations in place. And people didn't generally don't have access to third level um, education. Um, and me, until recently as well, meals were provided. So the right to cook wasn't available. And this was a, a, a particularly problematic aspect of this system. Um, and this system has received huge um, criticism over um, the 20 plus years of its existence in Ireland. And a very recent development is that the current government has committed to um, uh, abolishing this system and putting a new um, system in place that would be based on human rights. So this is a very welcome um, commitment, um, though it's it's really ca um, called into question by um, a huge issue we have in Ireland with housing, with the lack of housing supply. And then a second cohort are families who arrive uh, uh, via organized resettlement or relocation schemes. So these are, um, this uh, originated um, in 2015 when the government committed to taking in 4,000 refugees, primarily from Syria uh, through such schemes. Um, there was re resettlement before that, but it was scaled up at that point. And families in this situation are accommodated initially in reception centers. And this is envisaged to be for a few months before they then move to housing in communities dispersed across the country. And I should say that for the first cohort listed here, the, the, the system of dispersal exists as well, where people are dispersed around the country. And then a third um, group who are often kind of forgotten or and they are largely invisible in policy in Ireland are re reunified families. So these are individuals or families who arrive to be reunited with, with refugees who are already here in Ireland. And these could, for example, include um, unaccompl an unaccompanied minor who arrives in Ireland receives refugee status and applies for family members to then join them in the Irish context. And as I said, they're largely invisible in the policy context. So for these families, there's very little support available when they, when they arrive and are reunited with, with family members. And I've then added in um, a fourth category into this presentation today. And obviously, Ukrainian refugees who are arriving in Ireland at the moment could be seen as being part of some of the other categories as well. But the reason I've put it separately is that, you know, a particular system has been put in place for them, which is different to the system that's in place for many other um, refugees and international protection applicants. And um, so they are receiving temporary protection through the EU mechanism. Uh, Ireland has opened its doors and they haven't put any cap on the numbers arriving. So just to give a, a kind of a, a sense of the, the numbers, I suppose, generally speaking, so we might in visit in Ireland that we might receive around, it depends on the year and the pandemic has obviously had an influence, but around maybe 4,000 people might seek asylum independently in Ireland. So in the first category, and then there might be the government commits to bringing in about 700 or 800 through resettlement or relocation schemes. And then a small number might arrive through reunification. And um, so to put in context then the Ukrainian um, situation at the moment, um, we have um, in the past six weeks welcomed in 17,000 Ukrainian refugees. So that's the equivalent of what the number we might, ex in, in six weeks, it's the equivalent to the number we might expect generally to receive over the course of about four or five years. So it's obviously um, a, a, hu a huge number um, and Ireland is not used to, to having this number. And it's, you know, we're, we're experiencing significant problems, particularly around basic needs and basic accommodation um, needs at the moment. So just to, to think a little bit then, I suppose, about, so this is drawing on different studies that I've done and also on research of, of, of you know, more international research around the needs of refugee families. And obviously there are lots of different needs, so it's difficult to, to summarize them. But I guess for, for me, the need for support to deal with obviously the stressors of forced migration, and that obviously includes trauma and, and loss people have experienced, but also really importantly, the stressors of navigating resettlement in an familiar context. So, you know, the research tells us that while maybe the general public might have a perception that it's maybe the trauma that's the, the, the um, to the forefront in responding to needs, that actually when, when refugees arrive, often it's the day-to-day -day practicalities of resettling and trying to navigate um, the systems that are in place um, that are often really challenging for, for anyone to navigate, never mind somebody who might be familiar with the cultural context. 
Um, and then for in the Irish context, so, so I suppose in the first instance, that's probably familiar to all um, refugee contexts. But in the second one are the needs arising from the detrimental impact that the direct provision system has on children and families. So the fact that you know, people are living in these confined settings with many other people where people have not had the right to work, where people have been excluded really from integration policies and haven't and are been living in very rural areas without um, access to often to local communities has had a profound impact on people's um, um, mental health and on parenting capacity and, and on the kind of um, sense of autonomy that parents might have in looking after their children where often maybe managers of reception centres or direct provision centres get involved in the parenting practices um, of, um, of uh, parents uh, within these settings. And then the needs arising from, I suppose, the reconfiguration of family relationships after um, separation and reunification. So obviously when people have been, the, the research again tells us that separation has a, from family members due to conflict or other refugee situations has, as we might expect, a, a, a huge impact on people. Um, and people are obviously, generally speaking, really relieved, uh, the research would say, to, to be reunited with loved ones. But at the same time, often people have been separated for, for significant periods of time. And so that, um, that re reunification can be challenging and the family relationship, people have often changed considerably. You know, for example, unaccompanied minors have grown maybe from being 15 or 16 to being young adults who are very independent and have learned to live by themselves. And that reconfiguration of their relationship with their parents or with siblings can be very challenging. So I suppose I see these as maybe broadly speaking, the areas in which um, social workers might be able to provide support to, to refugee families. So just thinking then around the response of social work in, in Ireland, and I guess I'm seeing this really as quite a limited response in the Irish context. So there are very few social workers employed to specifically work with people of a refugee background. And the only real, real exception to this is the team that is charged with caring for unaccompanied minors who arrived. So that's the team I previously worked um, with many years ago. Um, and they have uh, you know, a lot of experience over many years of um, caring for this cohort um, of young people. But outside of that team, and um, there's a very small number of people employed to specifically um, meet the needs of, of refugee families. So there is a small number employed in the main reception centre in Dublin, and then there are a small number employed in the International Protection Accommodation Service more generally to conduct vulnerability assessments. And that's quite a recent development and, and a very welcome one. And I guess I, I was thinking a little bit about why this role is so limited. Um, and I suppose now that, you know, especially at the moment when refugee um, the conflict in Ukraine has led to refugee and discourse around refugees being so, so much highlighted um, in the media and in just general conversation. It seems very strange, actually, when we look back to, to, as to why uh, social workers haven't had a greater role. And I, I suppose there's a few things I think are relevant to this. So the first is the, the general peripheral position that international protection applicants or asylum seekers have in society as a result of the direct provision system. So as a result, of it being people being excluded from society that this in itself I suppose might, might account for some of this the reasoning why social work has such a limited role the exclusion of international protection applicants from integration policies so in the integration policy for migrants does not include asylum seekers or international protection applicants and I think that's a key point the consistent shortage I suppose of social workers across to most services in Ireland um, and the, you know, the, the, the state would recognise that we don't have enough social work graduates um, to fill existing posts. And this places obviously teams, general mainstream services under pressure. So it then kind of, I suppose, maybe contributes to um, teams maybe not advocating for, for work in this area because they're already under pressure and, and uh, finding it difficult to do uh, the work that they, that they already do. And then I suppose the responses of mainstream services to meeting the needs of international protection applicants, I suppose the fact that social workers in mainstream services do their best to meet the needs of international protection applicants, maybe that in itself in some ways contributes to um, their, their not being um, maybe a case made that particular services would be put in place for this, for this cohort. Rhea, how am I doing for time? 
about a minute left. Oh, <laughs> I have been putting it in the chat. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to, I, I didn't manage that that time very well. Usually I'm, I'm a bit better. So just to, uh, I'll make a, a few points just around the positioning of social work um, with refugees. So I guess arguing, I guess that social workers are really well positioned to work more extensively with refugees in the Irish context than I imagine in, in most other contexts as well. So on the left here, just a focus on holistic or psychosocial needs, the focus on person-centered practice within the profession, systemic orientation, the fact that it's a rights-based um, orientation um, within the profession, and there's attention to critical and radical perspectives, and there is an anti-racist and anti-oppressive practice orientation as well. And I think really importantly, the emphasis on reflexivity, including attention to power dynamics, is really important in, um, in the social work toolkit, if you like. Um, and really important in work with this population where there can be power dynamics that can be very damaging and there needs to be people working in this area who can um, pay attention to those and ensure that power is used in an appropriate way. Um, and then I suppose just very briefly mentioning the dilemmas and positions of discomfort maybe that are there as well. So the fact that for social workers, they're working if they're working within an oppressive direct provision system, and this is going to be um, inconsistent with the values of social work. And the fact that there is overrepresentation of children from direct provision in referrals to child welfare and protection. So the data on this is very limited, but what we do know would suggest that this is the case. And then I guess a lack of trust in social workers. So social workers being employed, as I mentioned, by the states, by the state themselves. Um, and they're in some ways they're agents of an often inept or inadequate state in responding to refugees. And this, this uh, reference to institutional ambiguity talks about the fact that asylum seekers may find it very difficult to distinguish between a social worker working for the state and somebody else working for the state who's trying to decide whether the person should get, a, get their claim for asylum recognized or whether they should be deported. So that institutional ambiguity I think is important. And then the way the public and maybe perceived social workers might play a role here as well. And then there is a question around the knowledge that social workers have for this area. So the general knowledge we have, I think, is really important, but there's probably a need for more specific knowledge for working in this area. And just a final slide um, to conclude. So the significant role, I suppose, of social workers then exists alongside significant gaps in the Irish context. And I'm, I have a quote here that I'm going to put up, and it's, it's in relation to an act, actually an aftercare worker working with a young person, an unaccompanied minor, who has turned 18, and the family members of the unaccompanied minor have arrived. And because of the gaps, gaps in services, the, the young person essentially is being the social worker for her, her um, his family family members. So the young person says to the aftercare worker, and um, without you, I wouldn't have been able to carry through. And the aftercare worker says, listen, now just see yourself as a social worker. And I think this really, for me, um, rings true the fact that there is in this quote, the, the young person is getting a really important service from a worker who's similar to a social worker. But on the other hand, the, the young person is also forced to actually be a social worker for their own family. So that's it. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for listening. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, so just an immediate question. Uh, Gultai Amanova asks, do you have Syrian or Afghan refugees in Ireland and do you know what their situation is statistically? So numbers. I, I don't know the numbers, I'm afraid, mm. but we do have um, both Syrian and Afghan refugees, both as people who come independently. And then, as I mentioned, the the most of the population of um, people who came through resettlement were Syrian. So the resettlement, um, and I'll post a link to some research I did on resettlement, and that was primarily Syrian, um, Syrian population. Thank you. And um, Shaheen Sultana asks, what kind of vulnerability do women refugees face and how does it impact their mental health and well-being? Which is quite a big question, but... Yeah, it's a big question, yeah. all right. Yeah, so I guess... Um, there would be some concerns around in the direct provision system that women face particular vulnerabilities around um, abuse um, and also in relation to poverty that um, some young women, some young women or women generally might be um, forced might be exploited as a result of their vulnerability caused by the poverty they're experiencing and then I guess I suppose in terms of mothers the vulnerability that they experience in relation to um, living in a system where their 
capacity to parent can be greatly impacted by just a system that's in place and by the the lack of autonomy that can sometimes be experienced when management in and I should have said at the start that the management in these centers and the people working in these centers don't have uh, requisite qualifications so they don't have backgrounds in social work or social care they tend to be people who've worked in the hospitality sector and obviously do their best but actually it's really I suppose my main point would be that it's not really fair on them to to expect people to do this kind of work which is so complex with a background in working in a hotel with tourists like it's a very different um, kind of um, kind of environment I guess. Yeah, there, there is a, another directly relevant question that might help people understand mm. the context, and it would be, uh, I'm sure, answered very quickly. Uh, Herbert is asking a question about the resources. He asks, what resources are available to social workers when working with refugees, perhaps in terms of budget, specific training, infrastructure? Mm. Um, so probably not, not very, I mean, I think most social workers in Ireland would say that they don't have enough resources, like many countries, obviously. Um, I think in terms of training, the training is like the training, I, I'm, a, I'm obviously an educator. So in the in university context, we cover refugee issues, but like all university education in relation to social work, it's highly regulated and there's a huge number of things you have to cover. So it's, it's limited and there's a real need for continuous professional development in this field. And um, so for example, the Irish Association of Social Workers is doing a lot of work at the moment around anti-racist education and providing a lot of support in that regard. And that obviously directly feeds into this. But I would say there's a real need for more um, training and more resource budget as well is always an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. At this point, we're going to pause and we will have more time so for question and asking at the end. And I will pass over to uh, Nakib Said, who is a young leader from Hummingbird Bird Project in Brighton, who will tell you more about his experiences. Nakib will also have to leave the panel at 6.20 uh, actually, uh, because um, he has to attend the Iftar uh, as he's fasting uh, because we are in the month of Ramadan. Um, so without further ado, uh, Nakib, I shall pass it over to you. And also important to say that as of this year, you're are studying social work at the University of Chichester in uh, England too. So a budding aspiring social worker. Thank you very much, Mia. Thank you very much for the invite. And hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope, hope everyone is doing well and keeping safe in the difficult time. Uh, today we'll be talking about my experience as a refugee settling in, in a new country and my social work experience. So my name is Naqib Saeed, I'm from Afghanistan, I'm a Hamibut Young Leader and a Youth Consultant, a Trustee for Safe Person International, an actor for Borderline, a coach for Brighton Table Tennis Club, a co-founder of Worthing Ping United, a youthful member for Economic Track for Y7 and G7 Summit, a winner of UK Parliamentary Award, Base Campaigner of the Year 2019, an activist for young people and a collective for the Long Crush Collection and a social work student, as we have mentioned, for Chichester University. Means, life means to be a challenge because challenges are what makes you grow. I arrived in this country on 29 April 2016. On my arrival, I didn't know what the home office or what the social services for young people are. The social services took me to a foster family. She was a good person. However, there was something missing. She already had three Afghan lads in her home. When they arrived, they weren't able to speak English. So she thought I can't speak English and she put me in the same skill. However, the social services told her that I can't speak good English. After a while, I decided with myself that as much life brings challenges, if you stay strong and positive, you can achieve your dreams and goals. That day, I decided that I will push myself and to make a better life in here. Nobody was really there to show me the town or teach me the culture or teach me the language. But I met some Afghan boys and we become close friends. And the journey begins from there. On my first day, I loved Brighton. And the reason was, it was a welcoming place, really diverse. 
And in my free time, I always wanted to go to library, read books and meet new people. So that's why I went to join a ping pong club, which called Brighton Table Tennis Club. So I started going to the club every day. I made new friends, we went swimming, cinema, and they teach me the culture, trips and everything. And that gives me the confidence that I could say, oh, we are all human and there's no difference regardless of what background we came from. After playing for a while, I'd become a coach for Brighton Table Tennis Club, which, I, which was something that I never imagined in my life. However, after settling in Brighton, I had to move to Worthing. And the reason was because I actually belonged to West Sussex Caring Service. This had an impact on my mental health as I tried my best to create a new life in Brighton. And all of a sudden, because of social services, didn't place me in Worthing at first place. That's where I'm supposed to be living. So that's why I need to leave everything in Brighton and move to Worthing. As a young refugee alone in a new place, there are some days that you really feel tired of life and you don't have the courage to fight for your life alone. I want you to give a common, I want to give an answer to a common question that most of foster families and social workers ask. Oh, he's acting mature. He's not 15 or 16 year old. Or he doesn't look like a 15 year old. Well, of course, we live a tough life back home. And at the age of 14, 15, we are trying to run and support our family. However, we are in a bubble when it comes to Afghan people and our community. Because we are 15 year old and live for a while in England and got the habit of English life and culture. And I meant this by telling us to act like a child more. On the other hand, the Afghan people tease us and question us, oh, why are we acting like this? You are not 15 year old. If you were back home, you, you would have run and support your family. When most of us, when we arrive in this country, we can't speak English. We are acting Sorry, we can't speak English. We will need time to learn and understand. I want to share a personal experience of mine. I was living in a supporting lodging. I wasn't able to cook. However, she gave me the confidence and support me. She would always mention that, oh, I need to speak slow as she doesn't understand some of my words I pronounce. If all the foster families treat their children the way they treating their child and not rather than shout, oh, it's your fault, you moved to this country and you need to learn English. Also, the social worker need to make sure that, that their foster families are listening to the young people. I've got foster families, the one where they treat their kids like their own kids and to involve them in all celebrations, festivals and even cleaning. The social worker need to try give the young person space the first days they meet them. They might be shy as it's a new place, but slowly they will get used to it. If we are told always that we need to learn English, always behave well, and otherwise this is gonna affect on your asylum as I heard from a lot of young people that the social workers say this, oh, you need to behave well, you shouldn't be in troubles, as it will affect with, with your asylum case. It's not going to change us. It's actually going to make us panic more. What we need is the time and the space. And we need a together work from our social work and teach us slowly, slowly that our brain can observe it and then we need the time to learn English and learn the culture. I always hated to stay at home by myself. I always wanted to go to the community places to get to know people, make friends and get to know the culture. And I always find it helpful to fight with my mental health also. A good 
role models I can say always have a big impact on on every young person life and for me always the people that they guide me and still always with me support me they become as my family and as my role model after a while living in the UK I met Elaine Ortiz who is uh, the founder of Hummingbird Project at the moment, she became a member of my family, and I can call her. She's my sister from another mother. I always never found words to explain her. She always stood up for my rights. She helped me to show the public my talent and what personality I got. She encouraged me to fight for myself, and I knew that she would also stand shoulder to shoulder with me. So I didn't give up. I continued my life, and I joined the Hummingbird Young Leader. The Hamburg Young Leader is a group of young people who meet every single week to practice public speaking, leadership and UK politics. Together we work hard to raise awareness of the problems faced by young refugees and we do this by going to MPs, Parliament, speaking at the events and organising changes in our own community. The main aim that we got is to show to the public that refugees and asylum seekers are actually educated and talented and we are not zombies or aliens that what media is portraying what we actually need is the time when young people feel alone getting to know our community will increase our knowledge of English culture and help us become a genuine member of the society. Social worker can play an important role in our life because whenever we got any issues, they will be the first point of contact for us. As a young person going through a lot in their life, for example, as an asylum seeker, we will be dealing with the home office, settling in a new country, with a new culture and language, all by ourselves and not having a single member of their family to support them. So it will be better if the social worker is giving the young person more time and building the trust. Young people have had experience with a lots of different local authorities and police. Some may be good, some might be bad. So it makes it difficult for them to build trust quickly because of their past experiences. But always try to be yourself. I'm a social work student. I did some works with young people and I always had the passion to help them and bring changes to their lives. With my social worker, I always had a really good social worker. They always stood up with me and guide me, not as as a member of the family. That's the reason that I want to be a social worker in the future and my social worker is always a role model for me because she didn't act as my social worker and some days we should, a good social worker would be kind of like if we leave the law and regulation a day for example a week and go to the young person and talk with them, build trust and it's important, I always say that a good cup of coffee and a good chat can solve any issues. So it's always not important that the social workers need to be kind of like strict with the rules. Or oh, actually, I'm just here to see you and we need to do your review and what we're going to do for another six weeks. Actually, that young person might not be feeling well on that day and he's not going to be well enough to plan ahead six more weeks. So it's always good to speak with the young people and get to know them first before we jump on on the law and regulation and the paperwork and all the details. I always struggled with my mental health and my social work will find different ways to help me. Whenever I feel down and I didn't want to see anyone, she would send me text messages to give me confidence and encourage me that I can overcome any problems and I should never give up. So that the idea of never give up in my mind came from when my social worker and other people in my life 
gave me the confidence and the courage when I said, oh, actually, I can't do this. But they stood up and said, no, actually, you can. And that made me encouraged that if they can believe on myself, why can't I? So I start believing on myself because of them believing on myself, on me. Sometimes even my social worker would send me a card and a really sweet message on it. That always made my day. For, our, for social work practitioners, it's not going to take us more than five minutes to write a card and send it to a young person. But for that person, it will mean the words because they will be thinking that there is someone that cares about us and they want us to achieve our goals in the future. My last message is for all the social workers that whenever we meet the young people, the important bit is just be yourselves and we're there to make positive changes to their lives. And it's always good to stand up for the young people and support them in all aspect of their life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I hope you can see all the applause that you're getting live from different participants. Thank you. I'm very much moved by uh, all your words and, and one of the comments in the chat was that you really brought to life everything that Warren was uh, talking about earlier. I'm very much aware that you will have to leave us soon, but um, um, and you're also getting beyond applause a lot of love from the audience as well, I, as I say. Um, one of the participants asks, uh, were you able to access education in the UK and did the social worker, if yes, what role the social worker, if at all, had in supporting you to access education? Uh, so, yes, I did. Uh, so. Because I arrived at age 16, so the first thing was that I need to go to college, but, and the social worker always tries to support you to put you to local colleges around you. And then they, ha they have like meetings every four or six weeks with the college to see how you're going on and your progress with the college. And if there's anything to be changed, like having personal tuition and things. But there is also an issue if you haven't got your status and you want to apply for university, then that's the thing that neither the social worker or anybody else can help. That's all relates to the home office. But from my experience, because I didn't have my status when I applied for uni and my social worker, what she then is, she said, let's just put the paperwork ready and see if they accept. And there were lots of other young people also, and there was some unis that got challenged and they said, actually, we give scholarships. So if they don't have a status even, they can come and then when they had it, we will just update it back. So the social worker does play a really big role in education because they will be the person that will be get contact from college and universities for admissions and all the admin work. Thank you. And that role is probably going to be different from country to country because social workers have different roles and you have emphasised what an important role Elaine Ortiz, who is uh, the founder of the Hummingbird Project, had in supporting you through the voluntary sector. Um, and um, one more question before I know you need to leave us. That's um, <laughs> uh, where do you see yourself as a future social worker? Is there any particular type of work that you're interested in and where do you see yourself working? Uh, I will be more working with, especially with adults, uh, asylum seekers uh, field, but I'm more into from ages 16 onward. And the main reason that I wanted to be a social worker is that whatever I experience in foster families or in my life, I don't want anybody else experience the same thing. So that's why I want to become a social worker to bring changes. And also I'm an activist to also bring changes to the law and policies, hopefully one day. But in, so that we are supposed to be going next year on the practice and I'm choosing the hummingbird to do my 70 days practice with them. Mm -hmm. So in the future, I'm probably gonna be seeing myself working as a social worker with the hummingbird project. It sounds that also it would be really good for you to have some practice in a foster care team Oh, yeah. with foster carers because mm -hmm. that would be amazing and you have certainly a lot of lessons for many many different aspects of social work with refugees thank you so much thank you i hope you get there in time and enjoy your <laughs> oh, thank you. yeah thank you so thank much thank you very much thank you. thanks
Right. Yeah, actually, before I uh, invite our next speaker to present, um, I'd like to, to say, uh, ask, answer the question that Giselle um, just uh, wrote in the chat books, whether if and in which platform all this material will, will be uploaded, um, both videos uh, and the teaching presenting material, the PowerPoint slides will be uploaded on the IFSW uh, portal. We will send a, a, a reminder, and this will become uh, enriched every week. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite our, our next uh, speaker, um, Nikos Trimiklinotes, who is a professor of sociology, uh, social sciences, and law at the University of Nicosia. Uh, Nikos heads the Cyprus team of experts for the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency of the uh, EU. And Nikos, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, maybe I can share my PowerPoint if, if that's okay. Uh, if you can enable me to do so, I think uh, yeah, the host has to allow me to do so. Can Can I ask Bernard to um, allow Nicholas to upload his his PowerPoint? Yeah. So you cannot see uh, the, the share screen button. I, I can't. Uh, it says that host disabled participant screen share. Right. Now you should be able to see it because you have. Ah, okay. Now I can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. And I will make this into. Uh, okay. Um, basically, what I want to talk about today is working with uh, refugees in a de facto, divide, in de facto divided Cyprus, which is. Nico, sorry for the interruption. Can you please uh, click on the uh, full oh, screen? Oh, sorry, yes. Because they, they yeah, yeah. Sorry. Excellent. Wonderful. Yes. So basically what I want to do is, is talk a little bit about uh, working with refugees uh, in de facto divided Cyprus. Uh, I must say that I'm, I'm also, I also teach uh, social workers. Uh, I teach them uh, the law of social work um, uh, at the University of Nicosia. So I do have dealing with social work but um, in this presentation what i aim to share with you is some insights about how working with refugees uh, in spite of the despair and the sense of burnout that people get um, with working against the current many times it is in fact can be a, a very informative and i would argue inspiring to understand um, how social work uh, these days in these morbid times can allow us to think differently uh, in terms of what is to be done, in terms of, of, of thinking strategically in the context of social work in war, conflict, and uh, peace, peace building and peacekeeping. Um, and let's not forget that social work is, after all, a practice based profession. So it's very important. But uh, I want to start with the locating Cyprus, where, where it is, what, what we're dealing with. Now, what I hope to present is how working with refugees, and here we're dealing with asylum seekers, uh, people who are uh, in, in position of applying for to become refugees, there might be migrants uh, or other uh, barriers uh, of, of rights of international protection. In the de facto related, de, de facto divided Cyprus, during this current pandemic times um, can be illuminating to understand how we can do social work. And my work is derived, and my, my presentation is derived primarily uh, not from the official social work, which I present in a very critical manner, but primarily from working with groups that have emerged, a network that has emerged as a result of the crisis of the pandemic. Uh, and Vasilis is one of the first authors who wrote the social work in extremis under these very, very difficult circumstances where there has been essentially a collapse of social work, uh, of social welfare support, primarily to migrants and refugees has created the conditions whereby civil society had to step in, individuals had to step in, people who said, okay, enough is enough, we have to provide by uh, food, blankets, basic amenities for people who are in need during these very difficult times. And what this is primarily where I'm going to be drawing my uh, the, the work that I'm I'm going to be presenting. 
Now, this is, um, and, and, I, and I insist that, uh, you know, thinking that this is from the drawing on the uh, global definition of social work uh, from the website, we can see that it is a practice-based profession and not just an academic discipline. So I think that we can, we can learn from that uh, from, the, from the very beginning. Now, what we have currently is in a, a divided Cyprus. This is divided Cyprus. This is the, the, the buffer zone uh, that divides the country. Um, it has been divided since 1974 in the current line. But we see here, these are the British bases in red. Uh, and this is the buffer zone, which is about, about 3% of the total uh, land of, of the country. And this is the location of Cyprus. Often this is the, the, the picture that we see that where people are coming from. Uh, Cyprus uh, adjoins uh, uh, three continents. Uh, it's 130, this is 130 kilometers long. Um, it's not an official border, but just a temporary ceasefire line since 1974. Um, British colony, the story, uh, I think there are parallels to what we saw. We heard the story with, with Ireland before. It is a divided country like Ireland. Um, it has, but it has suffered from an ethnic conflict. And we have a current, I won't go through the details of when and how it will happen because I'm going to spend more time. I'm just going to come to the end of this year that the division continues. And although we weren't affected by the European asylum and migration crisis, doesn't seem what we have seen after the closure of the route towards uh, um, uh, Europe uh, via the agreement with Turkey uh, and uh, the continuing if not uh, a massive expansion in the numbers of refugees, we saw a, a refugee uh, growth uh, applications in, in, in Cyprus. But social work in a de facto divided country is, is important for us to understand. Now, we need to know that the official social work was shaped by the reality of, of British colonialism and, uh, and afterwards, in the, the post-colonial context, it was shaped by the conflict itself. Um, in a divided country, it, although it was focused on, on this situation, we're dealing with the, with the situation where the, the, the social work is essentially uh, the official state work, uh, social work is, is, state, is a state-based system. So we currently have in, in the Republic of Cyprus a state-imposed sort of social work system and training, which is characterized by the very opposite of the definition of social work we have led, led earlier. So it's not about liberation, emancipation, social justice, rights, and equality. Although this is what I teach people at school, at university, and Basilis, when he was a, uh, a professor in Cyprus, was teaching them at that time. But the practice is the complete opposite. The practice is based on social control. It is based on uh, essentially imposing an oppressive social control system um, and in the context of the vast majority of refugees, asylum seekers and migrants, it is based on repressive, selective and increasingly racialized uh, immigration control system. And this is not confined, unfortunately, to the state sector. Um, we find that the same logic is imposed and extends on colluding quangos and on NGOs which are dependent financially uh, um, on, on, on the state. And we have a creation where the, the NGOs and social workers become more or less the long arm of this uh, oppressive system. And I think this is a big dilemma for social workers. Big dilemma, so they leave training. And when I teach them, I, you know, they, they fail their exam if they, if they show that they don't respect, they don't uh, apply the basic definition of social work. And, and they have to deal with the with this situation, but the reality is is quite different. So uh, Cyprus is divided. This is a, a stamp uh, of, of Cyprus that shows the the barbed wire, but the reality is one that is completely different to this. So you know, in one the one hand, refugeehood and and the sense that we are all we are all refugees in that sense. And Cyprus had a hundred and seventy thousand Greek Cypriots who were displaced to the south uh, and, and many, and, and about uh, 70,000, 70,000 Turkish Cypriots were displaced to the north. So this is very much part of our culture. Yet we have a situation which has, this has all, it's all being transformed and uh, we have barbed wire 
not imposed by the Turkish occupying forces, but by the current government of the Republic of Cyprus to stop refugees from other countries from crossing over to the south. And I think this is this is a serious problem. This is the, the, the pictures of the barbed wire that we have to take this into account. And I think that the reality is that we're dealing with a, a broad system which generates a hostile environment towards refugees. And I think what has emerged as a, a, as a, a practice from uh, the, the, this uh, uh, social work from below that I have described earlier is a response to this hostile environment. It's a response to uh, the basic idea that undermines any rights-based democracy integration, undermines the very logic of social work. So we have a situation where untrained people, people who are not trained with social work, have more understanding of what social work is about, or at least it should be about, from those who work for the state. And they work for the state in different camps, for instance, and they don't respect uh, uh, the, the, the people who, who work, uh, the, the people who are there. And, and I'm talking about camps who are in a very, problem, very problematic situation. So we have uh, unintended and unintended consequences uh, of, of this, and this is marginalization, exclusion, dehumanization, and exploitation of, of, of migrants. Uh, in particular, this and, and Cyprus has a long history of migration. I won't don't go through that. I'm showing here the, that uh, this is from the times of that Cyprus used to be part of the Ottoman Empire, and they brought slaves from Ottoman. So the, I'm not saying this should be accent; it should be uh, ignored. Or the fact that many Cypriots, I, I was born in the UK as a result of my parents being migrants. So we have a migration experience. We have also a displacement experience. Yet we have this situation which is very problematic, and this is a result of the realities of, 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 the, of the fact that we have a failed integration system, whereby the route towards legal migration is, is blocked. And also we have a hostile environment being created. And when I say hostile environment, it's because the, the main di discourses by them, by the ministry themselves, by the government itself, is, is an interchangeable two, uh, two sort of um, discourses which should have been mutually exclusive. On the one hand, they claim that asylum seekers are essentially bogus refugees, uh, economic migrants, essentially, who are just using the, the, the asylum system. On the other hand, they are saying that they are part of a, a conspiracy, a hybrid warfare and a plot by Ankara, by Turkey, to change the demographic character of the country. So how can they be both? Here, unfortunately, they are both. So, the, the, it's a major issue and this creates prejudices in a hostile environment, which I think this is not unique to Cyprus. Uh, I don't know if you think about Orban in, 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 uh, in Hungary, or if you think of what goes on in what Priti Patel is doing in the UK, it is what, it's happening all around the world. Yes? So we, we, this is not unique to Cyprus, um, but I, I'm describing the situation. Now, the interesting thing about this is that during the pandemic, there has been uh, a, a hygiene state of exception, which essentially uh, created what, what can be seen as a perfect storm. A perfect storm. Um, and it created, it pushed through uh, anti migration policies and anti, uh, anti um, asylum policy. And I think this is a very problematic issue. And this created a moral and a legal dilemma for, for social workers. And if I'm going to stand with the start, uh, just to mention something about unaccompanied minors. We have a large number of unaccompanied minors in Cyprus at the moment. Uh, they are confined in places. Let me show you some pictures so you know what we're talking about. This is, this is the, the conditions uh, in Purnara, the, the, the camp, uh, the major camp, which is a bit like Moria in Greece, a notorious place in conditions that, of, of this kind, uh, whereby recently, the um, the child commission ruled that children should not be confined there. Children should not be put there. Yet, children are put all the time there. And I, what I can tell you is, is, is this idea that we're dealing with um, uh, a situation, or if I can find my, sorry, here. Uh, we have system of a failed system, which I would argue seems to be deliberate. I mean, of course, nobody wants to kind of be seen as, as 
not accepting children. But the example is that we have a guardian system where the welfare system is supposed to be the guardian of unaccompanied minors. But the, the, the system is failing children badly. And just like, just to pass, give you an example. I recently, about two days ago, two nights ago, I went outside in the center of Nicosia. There have been five children from Somalia who had just arrived, who, are, who had just arrived there. This is a, the church, a, a Catholic church, and it's right next to a shelter, which is for children, not the camp, but a shelter for children. Um, these children had been wandering about outside this notorious camp to go and register. They had crossed to the north, to, from, from the north to the south, and they wanted to register. So where when I went there to say, okay, as part of this volunteer team, I want to ask, you know, whether they need it. Somebody walks out, uh, a social probably a social worker, a young social worker. I don't know if she was a student of ours, <laughs> an ex-student of ours who had become a social worker. I said, well, what do you want? I said, look, I'm here to, if there's any help. To this. She, she said, everything is sorted by the welfare office. The welfare knows better for this situation. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. The welfare, which is supposed to uh, decide in the best interest of the child. I said, how is it that it is in the best interest of the child for these five children, three boys and two girls, to wander around for 10 days and have nowhere to stay no food, nothing. They are all dependent and vulnerable outside this camp in the middle of nowhere and unable to register. And they come on a Sunday uh, afternoon outside the church. And the only reason the welfare send, uh, office sent someone there is because ambassadors were there and it was embarrassing and they had to go and take them to, uh, to register. And where would they register them? In the camp that I have shown you, which the child commissioner rule that it is unacceptable for children to stay there. This is an example whereby what is there as a system to protect children, you know, thinking in terms of the best interest of the child and having a guardian is actually there to stop these children from accessing any and having an opinion and accessing support from outside. So it is a, a, about social control, arbitrary, and bureaucratic state authoritarianism, as opposed to. Um, Iku, can you yeah. please start wrapping up in the next minute or so? So, yes. there's time so for I, all I want to say is that we are dealing with a, a, a situation whereby uh, this is a, a major thing. Things are changing in Cyprus. Uh, there's normalizing pushbacks. There are many things happening in terms of, 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 of rights. And I think that what I want to uh, finish off is to think about a policy system and some pointers for action whereby we can actually support those social workers who are working outside the official system. Because unfortunately, I see very little happening as a result of state policy. And I think international networks and international groups of supporting social, social workers from below must be there and we have to find system of certifying supporting so that children are not falling out uh, of the system i'm just giving the example of children but also other vulnerable people uh, who require social work support so that we can be in line with the definition of social work thank you great thank you very much nikos a couple of immediate uh, questions before we uh, open the floor to uh, questions to all speakers um, the, the first question is uh, from Anne Fitzpatrick, uh, who asks whether you think that the translation and role of EU policy regarding uh, migration and asylum seekers in the EU and the EU member states needs to be discussed more in social work education and more importantly in social work practice. So do we need to talk more about the EU context, the EU legislation in, in social work? Look, I think that uh, the the way in which we talk about the EU, is, I think in Cyprus they do talk about what the EU laws and the regulations uh, are saying, and I think there's more uh, interest in this. And increasingly, they, I think there's, it is included as part of the curriculum. What it fails to do is a critical reading of what goes on there. Because I think this is a major problem in how uh, people understand uh, um, the what is going on and, and how definitions and how things are working within the year. I just want to give one example of this. Um, 
the, the usually we think in terms of what they, they use developing is kind of good practices, not binding laws and binding minimum. Of course, there's, there's things about reception conditions which are positive. And, but I think we can draw on the positive things of the EU and develop critical and be critical of the negative things that are happening, like what is going on with, with Dublin, for instance, and, and what forces this is, or the hotspot system, uh, which has been uh, notorious in how it was organized. It was conceived as a positive thing, as having sorting centers so that they can decide where to distribute their people. But the result is that we have created uh, a, a very problematic uh, situation. This is a EU policy or the EU policy, the EU agreement with Turkey, which is a, a notorious policy in terms of, of what is going on and confining people in the Greek island or elsewhere, or the role of Frontex at the moment is it's, it's in a crisis. Now these, I think what we need is include a discussion of what goes on in the EU borders and EU policies, but we have to in, introduce much more critical elements exactly. of, of the EU. Great, thank you, Nico. And uh, inspired by a question asked by Fiza Sagir, I would like to ask both Nikos and, and Maureen a uh, question around how would uh, a social justice based social work and human rights based social work with refugees uh, look like? Mm? Uh, the, the type of social work intervention that we will want, how would it look like? And whether it's dangerous for social workers? Maureen, you want to go first or? Oh, I'll go first. Um, look, I think that uh, we have uh, um, models or we can think of models of social work, which, which deals with it. First of all, we need to empower social workers against their employers and their employer is the state. I think that's the first thing we can do to include social work. So to have social justice based social work, that's the first thing. So that social workers have the confidence. I mean, I've, I, I, because I teach this course and I know that, okay, what, what do you do when, when your employer, the state asks you to do something that is not in line with social work? So that's the first thing. We need to create a defensive shield to help them do that. The second thing is to social workers to feel the, 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 that they can actually proceed with um, with not just having a defense, that's a defense, to be able to go on the offensive. To be able to go on the offensive, we need to have uh, possibilities of social workers to move outside of a, a system which is uh, repressive and, and not based on on the, the, the rights of social work. So in this sense, we need to think of a, a transnational uh, mechanisms of putting the state uh, in control. So we need to make, we create systems of accountability uh, so that we can have this complicitly, uh, the complicit system. The third thing is to have a situation where there are effective sanctions for those who violate who, do, who are involved in violation of rights and undermine uh, social justice. Uh, and now, so that people can feel, okay, I cannot do that. I am not allowed to do this. So th this is also a, um, a defense for social workers themselves by their, their bosses who are ministers, populists, uh, politicians, or racists or whatever, uh, and bring out solidarity. So we need to create these transnational systems of accountability. Uh, and I think that professionally, there's a lot of room for that to happen exactly. if we are going to think in this term. Now, these are just exactly. three ideas uh, drawing from my own social work, but I think the, fi the final thing is to see if, if we can have um, um, the, the drawing on the energies of rethinking uh, social work outside and beyond uh, the state. Exactly, that's, that's something you know, mindful of, of time and, and we need Thank to discuss you. Marine, but solidarity is key uh, in, in this matter. And, and Marine, please, uh, your floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, I agree with, with what Nikos has said. I think in the Irish context, there's a campaign at the moment to include human rights in our code of ethics for social workers again, because it was removed a, a few years ago when there was a, a change to it. So I think that's a key, a key piece, um, I think you know, um, trying to train social workers to be able to do some of the things that Nico said. And I think, again, like I, it is incredibly challenging on a social work curriculum to be able to 
adequately deal with all of these issues like like Anne's questions in relation to EU policy like it's in Ireland it just simply wouldn't be possible to go into that level of detail in relation to one client group on a two-year program so I think there's huge challenges but I think we need to think about social work education as being beyond the university and the need for continuous professional development that focuses on human rights as well um, is really important and then I think the the involvement of social workers in NGOs uh, in the non-governmental sector is, is really, really important. So obviously we need to be able to get that social workers to advocate when they work for the state. But I think having social workers in NGOs as well that can more freely advocate and maybe can do so in, in, a, in an easier and uh, way is, is also really important. And thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, Ria, mindful of time, I don't know if you have any questions or if there are any other questions in the chat box that you'd like to raise. Yes, there was, um, there was two questions we will kind of wrap up with. First one concerns, Maureen, uh, your presentation. Is it good to practice, Dr. An asks, to employ social workers to specifically meet the needs of refugee groups and what kind of support these social workers need? Is this a specialist role which uh, exposes social workers to vicarious trauma and, and can be quite isolating too? Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I, I, like, I think there probably is a need for some specialist services. I think like in, in Ireland, the example of the team that uh, caters for unaccompanied minors have built up a huge amount of expertise in their role, which I think is really valuable. But I think at the same time, you also need to ensure that mainstream social workers in their roles also have um, you know, the, the required knowledge to be able to respond when, when refugees um, access their, their services. And in terms of the supports, I mean, I think like any area of social work practice, I mean, this isn't the only one where uh, vicarious trauma is an issue and where people, you know, ha have to listen to very challenging stories. So I think the need for reflective and reflexive uh, supervision is just always going to be really, really important um, in any area of social work practice, including in this area. Thank you so much. And there is a linked question for Nikos uh, from Rosalind Harbour saying, hi Nico, you mentioned some good social workers. How are these social workers resting or getting around hostile state policies? Although some of that was answered then through your presentation. Um, Look, I think that it's a dilemma um, here. Um, there are organizations, usually set up organizations who are doing great work, part of our network, who recently have been bullied. And they are bullied in different ways. They are threatened, particularly if they're in a vulnerable position, or they would be refused funding. And I think this, uh, this, this crackdown is, is, is causing a, a difficulties for, for, for people to work, particularly those who, who don't want to come to direct conflict with the state. So the way around this, well, you know, many of us just don't care what the state says, we'll go ahead and support them. But others would, they say, okay, I don't want to be bullied by the state. I'm saying that, yeah, that this is illegal, particularly, I mean, the fact that I have legal, I'm a lawyer and all that allows me to be kind of not to take this stuff. But others who are not legally trained feel uncomfortable. Say, it's illegal for you to go and offer children, for instance, uh, uh, clothes because they have to go back to the camp, for instance, if they leave the camp. You know, it's very difficult for people to stand up. That's why I think that what we need to think about is empowering them. And I think uh, there is a sense of solidarity. They are willing, or people willing to defy the state. And I think this is what has been going on. But also what is good is to have a solid system of support, mm -hmm. uh, public support, as well as specialists, training people, train people, who are willing to give them the information that they need to have and, and the legal and other backing they also need. So I think this is these are the, the key things that we need to think about. But I think we can all learn from each other. We don't have the answers to everything. We have the experience of the last thing. But I think through the international networks that we have, we must develop this system to support the providers well. Absolutely. And to develop new services and become a stronger lobbying body to promote human rights and bring that back into our profession mm. and those are very powerful notes i think to wrap up with Vasilios, i can't thank you enough and nakib who had to leave us to attend ifta um Vasilios, do you want to wrap up the session I, and I will, yeah, what i'll do is i'll just share the details of 
we ask everyone, if possible, to just complete a very brief survey to help us to see how the sessions are working for you, what other changes we need to make. Uh, and I've just put it in the chat link. Yeah, it's in the chat. The, the link can be found in the chat. Um, so this very interesting session has come to an end. I think it was a very uh, vibrant and, and the questions and, and the discussion in the chat probably presenters didn't have the chance to see uh, all the uh, questions, but there were hundreds of comments and, um, and, and very positive feedback. Um, we would like, we and I, on behalf of IFSW, would like to, to thank you for contributing to this seminar. I'd like to thank um, the participants, uh, again, for the second week, well over 300 participants attended today's uh, CPD. Um, crucially, I'd like to thank uh, Bernard Mayaka, who uh, from the uh, IFSW Secretariat, who works tirelessly to, to, to make uh, uh, this platform work, uh, and it's very complex. Um, so the next, the next seminar is due to take place on the 12th of April uh, next week, and the topic will be post-war reconstruction and transitions to peace. Uh, so stay tuned, we'll send a reminder, and it would be great to see you um, next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.